Peki herkese iyi öğleden sonralar. Öncelikle hoş geldiniz. Ee, zaten burada yazıyor ama bir de ben tekrarlayayım. Ee, bir kere tabii birçok arkadaşımız burada e, işini gücünü ya da e, tam başlamış olan okul sonrası ilk cumartesi gününü öğleden sonrasını burada geçirdiği için tekrar teşekkür ederek başlıyorum. Bunu zaman zaman tekrarlayacağım. Ee, içten duygularımızı yansıttığı için çünkü... E, bu tür toplantılar düzenlemek düğün gibi biliyorsunuz. Düğünlerde de işte kim geldi kim gelmedi, işte gelenler bereket versin nereye oturduk falan meselesi yok. Yani bizi uzağa oturttular, müziğe yakın oturttular, tuvalete yakın oturttular vesaire. Burada herkes bulduğu yere oturdu. Ee, o nedenle e, İstanbul'un zorluklarına, salonumuzun sıcağına, dışarının beklemin vesaire katlandığınız için ayrıca teşekkür ediyoruz. E, bu toplantının temel amacı ama birçok bu alanın bütün zorluklarına beraberce değişik ortamlarda katlanan hastanelerde, psikoloji merkezlerinde, sivil toplum örgütlerinde, üniversite, üniversitelerde, devlet hastanelerinde, mecbur hizmette, doktor, psikolog, eğitimci, akademisyen birçok e, dostumuzu bir arada görmekten mutluluk duyuyorum. Bu... E, Toplantının e, birkaç gündemi var. E, bir ana gündemi sizinle bir bilimsel e, beraberlik yaşamak, bir sunumu paylaşmak e, değerli bir konukla e, beraber. E, i̇kincisi bunu e, organize eden e, YDY'nin e, kendini e, bir şekilde tanıtması. E, ama o konudaki bilgiler zaten elinizdeki dostlarda merak edenler Onları okuyabilir. Sadece eğitim ve toplantı, kongre bu gibi şeylere ilgisi olan bir grup olduğu için orada özellikle eğitimle ilgili bazı çalışmalara merak edenler, katılmak isteyenler, yazmak istedikleri şeyi doldurup bırakırlarsa öyle bana bunu belirtmem hatırlatıldı. Dışarıya hani adınızı ve oradaki ilgili kuponu koparıp atabilirsiniz. Sadece ilgileniyorum demek yani. Başka bir anlamı yok tabii ki. Evet. Ben öncelikle lafı çok uzatmadan bugünün programını da kısaca yansıtayım. Ee, yaklaşık 80 dakikalık bir konuşma Jim Lekman'ın konuşması. Ee, yaklaşık yine bir 20-25 dakikalık bir zamanı tartışma e, için e, ayırdık. E, sorular cevaplar. Konu hem klasik hem ilginç bir konu. Çünkü e, değerlendirme ve formülasyon özellikle çocuklar ve gençlerle çalışmakta ee, çok temel bir alan. Buna daha çok e, özellikle çocuk ve ergen ruh sağlığı alanında çalışan bütün meslektaşlarımızın kullanabileceği bir e, bilgi, bir araç olarak e, düşünmek ama birçok durumda e, uygulayabileceğimiz hem geleneksel tıp tekniklerinden hem gelişim bilimlerinden hem e, psikolojik bir anlayıştan hepsinin e, karması bir süreç olduğunu söyleyebilirim. Ben konuğumuz Jim Lekman'ı tanıtmadan önce kendisiyle ilgili bir kısaca bilgiyi vereceğim. Nasıl? Gösterebiliyor muyum? Şu mu? Şunu açtım gibi ama. Ha tamam. Sağ ol. Tamam. Ee, tamam ben basarım. Teşekkür ederim. Jim Lekman kendisi Yale Üniversitesi Tıp Fakültesi'ne bağlı olan Child Study Center'ın uzun yıllar araştırma direktörlüğünü yapmış. Orada bir profesör, çocuk psikiyatristi ve birazdan da bahsedeceğim gibi birçok özelliği sebebiyle bugün için seçtiğimiz bir kişi. Birincisi... Psikiyatr ve çocuk psikiyatri, hani benzer formasyonda sağlamda bulunan doktor arkadaşlarımızla birlikte. Ayrıca psikanalist olarak yetişmiş bir e, doktor. Çünkü Yale Child Study Center'ın içerisinde e, Anna Freud'un başlattığı bir ayrı bir psikanaliz enstitüsü var. Anna Freud'un kurucusu olduğu. O nedenle e, psikanalitik düşüncenin etkisinin olduğu ama bildiğimiz, alıştığımız anlamdaki psikanalitik düşünceden biraz daha farklı bilimsel gelişime açık, nörobilimlere e, ilgili e, katı olmayan, ortodoks olmayan, e, ilaç tedavilerinin e, keşifleriyle uğraşan vesaire bir 
ekibin olduğu bir yer. E, gelişimsel bozukluklar konusunda e, özellikle e, uzmanlaşmış bir klinisyen ve bağlanma ve ilişkiler üzerine odaklı bir bakış açısı olan bir klinisyen. E, ilgi alanlarını e, aynı zamanda son dönemde bilhassa erken çocukluk dönemi ve bunun barış aracı olarak erken çocukluk döneminde çocukların kazanabileceği, çocukların ve ailelerin kazanabileceği yetilerin barış amaçlı kullanımının mümkün olup olmadığının araştırılması ve bu alanda hem sosyal hem nörobiyolojik araştırmalardan e, a, yararlanan bu konuda dünyada önce olarak bilen İstanbul'da da iki gün önce iki gün son iki günde sürmekte olan bu konuda bir UNICEF, ACEV ve Yale Üniversitesi'nin işbirliği bir toplantıda da, da ayrıca bulundu. Onu da merak edenlerle e, paylaşmaktan mutlu olacağını tahmin ediyorum. E, araştırmayla ilgili temel e, odak konusunu, merak konusunu da nörobiyoloji ve gelişim bilimleri olarak ö- özetleyebiliriz. Nörobiyoloji ve gelişim bilimleri derken e, bir embriyolo- embriyolojik gelişimden e, tutun. Anne çocuk ilişkisi, baba çocuk ilişkisindeki işte bonding, attachment gibi temel süreçlerin anlaşılmasına e, yine bu süreçlerde rolü olan, medyatör rolü olan e, oksitosin gibi nöropeptitlerin ya da e, ilgili beyin e, bölgelerin aktivitesinin anlaşılmasına kadar uzanan genişlikte bir merak alanı da içermek, içerdiğini biliyoruz. Ve bunu gelişimsel perspektifte de kont- bağlamın ve zamanın yani hangi zaman diliminde ve hangi bağlamda bir sürecin yer aldığını anlamak, psikopatolojiyi de ruhsal durumdaki bozulmayı da o bağlamla yani çevresel etkenlerle bireye ait etkenlerin biyolojik veya doğuştan getirilen başka etkenlerin bir kombinasyon olarak gören gelişimsel psikopatoloji bakış açısına sahip bir kişi kendisinden biraz daha dinleyeceksiniz. Ve tabii benim kişisel olarak benim yanında yetiştiğim bir kişi, kişisel olarak da önem verdiğim ve herkesin önem verdiği bir özelliği Dr. Lekman'ın mentor, öğretmen nitelikleri. Bugün de zaten ona burada beraberce tanık olacağız. Ee, Amerikan Çocuk Psikiyatrisi Akademisi'nin e, beş kez outstanding mentor yani en iyi Amerika'daki hoca diyelim Türkçe'de seçtiği e, gerçekten yakından tanıyanların özel bildiği. Üstelik bu sınırlı değil. Burada birkaç tane aramızda arkadaşımızın fotoğrafı hatırlayabilir. Mesela Marmara Üniversitesi Hastanesi'nde bazı asistan arkadaşlarımızla değişik zamanlarda daha en sonunda geçen salı ama sadece Türkiye'de değil Brezilya'da, Çin'de her yerde e, hocalık etmekten keyif alan yetiştirdiği ya da elinin dokunduğu birçok e, kişi e, var. Şurada ön sıradaki bir hanımefendi orada görüyorum mesela fotoğrafta. E, ve tabii anmadan da geçemeyeceğim. Hani benim e, İstanbul'a ilk ziyareti 1996 e, sevgili İnce Vural, İnce Vural arkadaşımızla birlikte düzenlediğimiz Robert College'in salonundaki bir konferans vardı. Orada bulunanlardan aramızda olanlar var. E, Donald Cohen, e, Jim Lekman, e, ben de kenardan e, yani, ne derler yancı olarak e, yanlarında olduğum 1996 senesinden bir fotoğraf. Donald Cohen'i maalesef kaybettik e, ortak hocamız e, ama... E, Cim hem e, gelenek olarak hem de bakış açısı olarak onu da aşan e, birçok e, noktada olduğunu bildiğimiz bir hocamız. Ve Türkiye ile ilişkisi de 20 yıllık aktif e, işbirliklerine dayalı, eğitimciliğe dayalı ve Türk kültürünü kendisi mütevazı bir konu ama oldukça iyi de bildiğini düşündüğümüz bir meslektaşımız. Ben lafı daha fazla uzatmayacağım. E, kendisini kürsüye davet edeceğim. Ondan sonra ben de bu e, konuşmayı ben de ilk defa dinliyor olacağım. Slaytları gördüm ama o yüzden benim için de heyecan verici e, yeni bilgiler. Klasik bir konuyu tekrar tekrar birisinden dinlemek. Yani bu işte 40. senfoniyi 50. kere dinlemek gibi belki bazılarımızla tanı vesaire gelebilir. Ama aramızda tecrübeli e, büyüklerimiz diyebileceğim meslektaşlarımızın da olması e, bu konunun ne kadar herkes için e, değerli bir yanı olduğunu da gösteriyor. Tekrar hepinize hoş geldiniz diyorum. Önümüzdeki e, bir buçuk saatin verimli geçmesi dileğiyle.
things I wanted to focus on today had to do with our connection with our patients. And none of you would be sitting here today unless you had a real interest in finding a way to do the best job you can for the families and for the children who come to see you. So I'm grateful for that, and I think it's wonderful for Turkey and for Istanbul that you're here. It's interesting, too, because one of the components of this new YDY focuses on a foundation of science. And I guess for me, um, one of the interesting things that I will mention in my presentation, and once again, Yankove, I have far too many slides, so you're going to have to give me some clues when I need to stop. But some of the very best questions for the science that I've done have come directly from my patients. Listening to them, hearing from them what the story is, has actually increased my knowledge and my ability to focus on questions that matter. So I'll share with you a little bit of that. In fact, I'll show you a video, if I can, of one of the patients who has taught me a fair amount. Another active ingredient in YDY, at least to the extent that I understand it, has to do with bringing up the next generation of academic and clinical leaders. And I think that's who I'm looking at right now, although there are some of us that are a little older. So what I wanted to also say is the importance of mentorship. So one of the things I will focus on, although I may go fast through some of these slides, is how important it is to connect with others, how interconnected we are in this world, and to have someone who really respects and admires the work that you're doing and sees you as being able to move forward in this discipline to accomplish what you want to achieve, whether that's doing additional research or whether that's providing the very best clinical care. So let's see if everything works. Okay, so if I were in the United States, I would have to give you a disclosure statement. But I thought, gee, it might be fun to actually tell you all of the things I'm currently doing. So, um, Yankabe mentioned Achev, and we just finished a two-day session looking at um, early childhood as a foundation for peace. Is there some way in which if we work to improve the early lives of children, we could actually make a difference in this world with regard to having more peaceful individuals, more peaceful homes, more peaceful communities. I'm currently doing a study in three Palestinian refugee camps in Beirut, Lebanon, that's funded by the UBS Optimus and the Open Road Alliance. And basically, we're doing a Achev program, the mother-child education program, in Beirut in three refugee camps. I also currently have a big grant that, uh, and it's interesting because several of the papers that I wrote with Yanki Yazgan when he was with us at Yale were with a gentleman by the name of Bruce Wexler. And several of the papers that I've published with Yanki Bay were also with Bruce. And Bruce has been working with me to develop programs to help children who are at risk or who have this condition called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And rather than using medications, what could we do in terms of sports activities and computer games? Although I must say the computer games we have are a little bit more boring than the ones that the kids really enjoy. But that's uh, funded through our NIH uh, project. And I will mention a few things about Tourette syndrome. Um, we just recently had our book come out uh, from Oxford University Press for Tourette. 
and you can't see this picture very well, but there's uh, Sir Michael, and here is the editorial board, and given the number of young ladies in the audience, I'm pleased to say that the lead editor is this uh, young woman right here, Anita Thapar. Uh, she's a child psychiatrist as well as a geneticist. And uh, some ever, and actually the fellow who was also the co-author with me for this particular chapter, Eric Taylor, is also one of the lead editors as well. But this will be coming out in uh, probably August of this year. So I think you'll recognize the picture. Um, and it's interesting, too, because um, for a number of years I was on the editorial board of the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. And the job that I had was to come up with special is issues having to do with research. So one of them had to do with global psychiatry and blah, blah, blah. But one of them I did with Yankee. And this was looking at what we call developmental transitions, but the real word is prodromes. This was basically asking real experts in the field to join us in talking about what are the features and presentations that we see in our children before they develop the full syndrome, and teach us about that in terms of the review article that you're preparing. Um, and some of the people were really quite uh, distinguished that we had uh, join us for that uh, event. I'll get it right sooner or later. So this is the Acho Foundation. Um, this was a paper that they had asked me to discuss uh, some years ago, and it actually came as a result of the work that they were doing with fathers and finding out if they brought together groups of fathers that they actually wanted to continue to be friends after they had completed the program. And this led them to this question about whether or not, if we invest in early childhood, could we really make a difference in terms of creating a more peaceful world? And this was also done with, uh, I'm not sure if you can see Chitam here and Diane Sunar is right here, uh, but several of our Turkish colleagues were very actively involved in this, what we call Ernst Struckmann Forum. And basically we brought together people in Frankfurt, Germany for five days. Nobody got to show a slideshow. It was all entirely, let's have a discussion about what the next step should be in terms of our science and our research if we really want to explore the question about whether early childhood and peace building can have some relationship with one another. And so it's been wonderful uh, to be here in Istanbul and to actually reconnect uh, with uh, our colleagues here in terms of distinguished psychologists, uh, including uh, Chitem and Diane. And this was the conference that we had uh, just two days ago. Okay, so um, I'm, I have two slides of key points, and I go through all sorts of things about each one of them, and I'll give you an illustration with regard to my own work in Tourette. But when someone comes to see you, it's really important to have some notion about what the questions are that they want answered. And of course, that may not be the same for everybody in the family. It may be a slightly different story with regard to the mother, the father, the family members that are also present, what the impact is with regard to the siblings. All of these things are crucially important. And what are they hoping for? What are they expecting? And having a real clear understanding about that is also very, very important. And then there's the question of timing. Why now? Is there some sort of event that happened? Is there some sort of circumstance? Or were they just on the waiting list long enough that they finally showed up for the, for the evaluation? And who is this child? And this is one of the things that I'll go into in a little bit of detail. And I guess for me, and, it, and it's interesting, I, I guess I had a conversation with Yankabe yesterday and it was an issue of uh, how much time do you really have to devote to meeting with a family? 
So I'll probably run through some of these slides in a few minutes, but basically I will send them out all sorts of information. I will ask for information back from them and I will typically review and evaluate all of that information before I see them so that I can actually have a direct conversation with the family as if I actually had some acquaintance and knowledge of them. The other thing that often surprises the family when I first meet with them is that, and I'll, I have more slides, but what I ask them to do is to tell me about their child. And they want to tell me about the problems. But I want to hear about what this child can do, what this child is good at, what this child enjoys doing. Because I have found over the years of my work as a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst and others that it's often those strengths, those abilities, that is a source of resilience for the child. And unless I'm acquainted with what those are, it can be problematic for me to really move ahead uh, with the family. So for me, it's very important, and it's always a sign to worry about when you ask a parent, oh, tell me about Aras. Uh, please brag about Aras for me. But if the, if the parent somehow doesn't have a way of communicating some positive aspects of that child's life, that's a source of worry and concern for me because and then the other big issue, and Yankee also mentioned this in the introduction, the whole issue of the attachment. So one of the things that I think is unfortunate about at least some aspects of the clinical care that often is offered here is that there are so many people in need, at least within the public sector, perhaps not even the same patient, uh, same doctor, at least in child psychiatry, would be actually be seeing the child in the subsequent visits. And for me, one of the things that I see as a major task is, let me make a connection. Let me find out who this is. And there is also a continuity of care that as a, I would almost call it a moral value, although maybe one should call it a clinical value. I feel like if somebody's going to come and try and make a connection with me, let me be steadfast. And as long as they want to keep coming back to me, then uh, I'd be happy to see them and to follow them. And, you know, I get text messages and emails all of the time. Another thing that I would just like to emphasize, and this probably comes more again from my experience in Tourette syndrome, has to do with education. And what I mean by that is if the family understands what we understand to some degree about what the nature of the problem is and what the nature of the longitudinal course might be, what the key features of the illness are, that can be enormously helpful and often can really have an impact in reducing stress. So I'll probably tell you one of two of stories about the, some of the Tourette cases and I'm delighted that there are two folks here, medical students, could you raise your hand, uh, who are interested in learning a bit more about Tourette's and again, somehow they've connected with Dr. Yazgan and um, it'll be fun to, to do that. So another key e issue is we don't have all of the answers. It's in some ways surprising how little we know and how much the families expect us to know. And I guess for me, sharing with them the education that we have, the knowledge that we have is important, but it's important too to formulate hypotheses about what's really going on, what the nature of the issues are within that family, within the context of the family, within the school, within the community. And then to work together as a team with the family to actually have some impact. And Oftentimes, for the very complex neuropsychiatric disorder cases that we see, that requires not only forming a team, team with the family, but also with the school and with other providers as well. So, I'm not sure if Yonke really looked over my slides. He probably didn't, but uh, I just thought it would be fun. There's plenty of seats over here. You don't need to worry about it. Um, but 
what aspects of your career? So this is sort of a celebration of YDY, so you can read the chapter, blah, blah, blah, blah, blah. I, I just told you what it said. Um, but I thought I would share with you some aspects of my own personal history in addition to my friendship with Bianca Bay that is relevant. And so uh, we saw Donald's picture before, but here I was, this guy who arrived at Yale. I did my adult psychiatry training, and then I had the opportunity to work with Donald Cohen. And Donald was a distinguished uh, senior professor again had an interest in autism, an interest in Tourette syndrome, and obsessive compulsive disorder. But he believed in me. He actually idealized me. And one of the reasons that I worked as hard as I did for as many years as I have is I didn't want to disappoint him. So I would say, you're finding someone like that who's a more senior individual who has the experience that you can see and that you admire and making the connection. And there's actually going to be, I think, a retreat tomorrow. Uh, Jetta was telling me about this. And this is one of the things I'm going to be emphasizing to the YDY team is how can we make those connections across the generations? How can we find ways of idealizing those individuals in the next generation so that they're willing to invest the time and effort that it takes to make a difference? Oh, and this was the book he wrote just before he passed away early, and it emphasizes again the whole issue of interconnections. Life is with others. So we do have a sociologist with us today, and uh, you can't see it, but let me tell you about it. So this is just, uh, actually there's a fellow uh, at Yale who's very involved in uh, social networking. And I'm glad to see I can't see anybody using their iPhone just now, and I need to find mine. I'm not quite sure where it's at. But you can actually now keep track of, you know, who's connecting with who. Uh, I'm not really a representative of the National Security uh, Agency that's had such troubles in the United States. But we're basically all interconnected. The truth is that we are interconnected. We may look like separate people, but the truth is we are deeply interconnected. And that truth is, regardless of what ecological level you're looking at, it's true. So what I'm saying is that if you actually look at our brain circuits, no one neuron does a thing. It's only by the interconnections with other neurons. That little team of neurons in that particular uh, node that we call, you know, some particular um, area of the hypothalamus or whatever it might be, that's the circuitry that we see. And of course, if we went down even lower in terms of what's happening inside of a cell or what's happening with regard to atoms, the same is true. No one, no one electron is doing much of anything. It's only in combination with these other subatomic particles that anything's happening. And then, this is my favorite part of the story. It turns out that the astrophysicists tell us that there's something out there called dark matter and dark energy. How many of you have heard about dark matter and dark energy? Something like 94% of everything is dark matter and dark energy. Can you believe that? He doesn't look like dark matter and dark energy. I, I'm not sure. On the other hand, the, the, the astrophysicists don't know much about it, but when they do experiments to see if we had to figure it out, what would we see? These are these nodes and networks that are actually created. So whether we're talking about subatomic particles, whether we're talking about our brains, whether we're talking about our social interactions, or whether we're talking about the cosmos, we are all interconnected. And this is part of the reality of what clinical work is all about. So this brings me to another point, and I should have included a picture of uh, Dr. Yazgan here, but he is one of the few people that's using his iPhone right now. Uh, <laughs> he's tweeting. Uh, but the other thing about being in an academic setting where there's a real investment in research is that and I might as well go on to the next slide, um, is that clinical care, for me, 
is where it starts. And the fact that my patients are the ones who have taught me about some of the things that I care about the most is important. But the other thing that's fundamentally important is that when you have that relationship with a family and you're interested in hearing from them about the issues and conditions that they have, it's also a wonderful opportunity to train the next generation. So I see this commitment to provide the best clinical care and this tradition is also the starting point for our research and for the training of next generation of clinical and academic leaders. So I'm just going to tell you the story about uh, premonitory urges and, and, and you should let me know, Yankee, when I need to be. So it turns out that if you listen to individuals with Tourette syndrome, so I'm going to address the, the fellow that is interested in this topic, one of the things that they may tell you once they reach the age of about seven or eight is that there is an urge that precedes the tick. So rather than just going like that, there's a feeling that they have that's sometimes very difficult to describe. It's almost ineffable. And I do apologize to whoever's doing the translation because I'm not following my slides as well as I should. It's okay. <laughs> uh, but it's so interesting because there's this intense feeling that they have to do it. And there's this momentary sense of relief after they've done it, um, especially if they get it just right. It's a terrible urge that needs to be satisfied. And one of the, one of the really difficult things about this is that sometimes the urge and the need to get it just right involves having pain. You know, it needs to, you need to have that pain or whatever. And whenever that's part of the story, I have a deep worry because that may actually lead to self-injurious behavior. And after I'm finished with my time in Turkey, I'm going off to an international conference in London on Tourette, and I've been asked to speak in the pre-meeting having to do with brain surgery for individuals with very severe self-injurious tics. So that's just another example. Um, this is one of the papers we did with one of our trainees. This is sort of the picture that you can see of the places where you have the urges. And this is a fellow by the name of Natan. And um, this is an example of the kind of thing that is typical of me. So here was a bright young boy who came to see me. He had his own, and I was going to show a video, but I think to save some time, I probably won't. We can give it a try. Anyway, you can see here he has something called cramps, and this is one of his eyes, and these are tight feelings. Um, we'll see if it works. You can see it really well on this screen. So if you go back to... People wanted to hear my tics. You can keep going, you don't need to. How I got rid of my tics. This is one of the toys in my office. This is where he had his cramps, and it was in his eye. So these were tight feelings that he had in his throat that were associated with the... These are the areas I had where my ticks. So 
So he's teaching us about habit reversal therapy now. He made a fist, and I'm not sure I would recommend this to any of my patients, but basically by putting his fist in a certain spot, he was able to relieve his tics. So he clamped, he clamped his jaw. <laughs> we can stop it now. You, you can stop it. Sorry. And just go back to the slideshow. So this is a good example for me, is by having him be my teacher, by having him be my professor, I'm, I'm indicating to him that I really value what he has to say and that, what, uh, that I'm listening and that it matters to me. So, um, did I do something? Yeah. So this is actually a fellow who for a, a many years was actually the chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee for the Tourette Syndrome Association, and he's a famous neurobiologist uh, by the name of Peter Hollenbeck, and he basically sees these premonitory urges as being a, a core feature of Tourette. And I would say the reality, it's only through our sustained partnership with these patients and their families that we've been able to do the research that we've done over the years. And have we been able to actually train the next cadre of academic leaders for our field. And um, this is a little ancient, but this is the kind of thing that I would hand out to my families and I would teach them about, and this has to do with what we call psychoeducation. And basically, having them learn about the basic features of Tourette, because many of the families didn't even know about these premonitory urges. And if they understood that the reason why he's going like that is because of feeling back here, it, it became more sensible to them. It also uh, helped them realize that even though, if you said, please stop it, stop doing that, they could stop it for a little while, but then they would come back again, and when the ticks came back again, why are you still doing that? Didn't I just tell you to stop it? And you were able to stop it. What are you, why are you doing this? So uh, it's really helpful for them. And what happens is that you reduce the level of stress in the family. And by educating them, and this may be particularly true of some weird disorder like Tourette, but it's true probably for other conditions as well. So this was part of the uh, introduction to the book that we wrote for uh, Oxford University Press. We dedicate this book to the real experts on Tourette syndrome, the individuals with this disorder and their families, and to all of our mentors. Uh, but basically acknowledging that it's only through our patients that we have learned as much as we have. So for me, and this is true of all of the disorders and conditions, oh, I should also back up and just say, another feature of YDY that I really like is there is an emphasis on providing the very best care possible and learning about the latest technology and the latest techniques in terms of treatment. And it turns out that many of those at the leading edge are actually psychological treatments. Whether you know it's exposure and response prevention or habit reversal training or comprehensive behavioral treatment for tics or one thing or another with regard to various anxiety syndromes or depression, those are very important interventions. And to have a center here in Istanbul where people can come and learn how to use these techniques and to have supervision by trained individuals, I think will be extraordinary. But this comes back to the point I was making earlier about we need to build on a person's strengths. And you need to find out what they are if you're going to build on them. So I just came back to those uh, core slides that I showed earlier. So I'm just going to elaborate on each one of them and then I'll finish. And uh, I was going to say, if anybody has any questions along the way, please raise your hand, but it's a little weird standing up here and asking you to do that. But if anybody does have a really strong question they need to have answered right away, let me know. 
But who made the referral? What prompted the referral? What are the key questions that need to be addressed? Are there different points of view concerning the need for clinical assessment? Are there clinical or administrative issues that need to be considered beforehand? So it's interesting. I, I, I was uh, scheduled to see a patient, and I realized that when I talked to the family ahead of time, that there was actually another person at the Child Study Center that would have been a much better person for them to see. So I made arrangements for that individual to actually be directly involved in the evaluation uh, rather than um, coming to see me. Be clear about the questions to be addressed and what the expectations are. Who is this child and why now? Um, this, is, this is actually my oldest grandson. Um, uh, I didn't ask my daughter for permission, but I just thought it would be fun to introduce you to my grandchildren as well. Um, but, you know, what are the strengths and interests of this child? What is the ecology of the family, the child's environment in terms of micro, meso, and macro levels? And finding out all of the information and formulating hypotheses along the way. Um, this is the thing I told you about bragging. This is my youngest, well, not my youngest, this is my youngest grandson. Um, and whether he's really going to be a rock star or not, I don't know. But uh, this is when he's just three, so who knows uh, what the possibilities are going to be later in life. Um, and this is also, just as I will ask them to brag about their child, the other thing that I will typically do is say, what question would you like me to be able to answer to the best that I can? I may not know the answer. I may only be able to give you some advice about how best to proceed. But what questions do you have for me? And um, it's interesting because if you go around the room, it's not always the same question from uh, this mother, from this father, or from the child. So you need to ask, <laughs> you need to ask everybody. Um, this is another one that's really so crucially important, is what's the nature of the interaction between the, the family, between the child and the parents? What's the nature of the interaction between the mother and the father, or whoever the caregivers are? Uh, Yankebe's uh, become quite interested in um, the role of grandparents, uh, so we'll see uh, how long it takes before he's a grandfather, but uh, he was talking about the potential role that grandparents can play in that early child development issue that we were talking about. But what is the nature of the interaction? So it's always fun to come into a setting like this and to see people, you know, sharing coffee and, and uh, treats and just to watch the interactions, and it comes back to this whole issue of the sort of dynamic interactions that occur. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if you don't have much time. I'm sure you're probably spending time by, by, with the parents by themselves and probably some time with the child by themselves as well, and that's typically what I would be doing. Although by the time they reach... Um, Aras's age, I usually need to make sure that uh, they really are okay with having their parents sit in on the conversation. And sometimes um, the child would also like to sit in on the parent conversation, and when they you know, are old enough, that's something I usually try to observe. But what are the cultural norms, etc.? Uh, so this is another grandchild who's my granddaughter. Um, but what can you tell about the parents? How do they feel about themselves? What's the nature of their feelings with regard to the child in terms of this? Is there some degree of family discord that's evident in terms of the way in which you see them interacting? And this has to do with the observations that you're making during the clinical assessment and critically important. What's the level of hubbub uh, in the family? What's the nature of the relationship between the siblings? These are all things that I try to have some understanding of when I'm working with a family. So you may be asking yourself, well, how much time does he spend with a family if he's doing all of these things? And that's one of the privileges, I would have to say, of being a professor at Yale, is I can spend as much time as I want, and it's often um, you know, two or three hours uh, for an initial evaluation. So that may not be feasible in the context of many of the clinical settings in which you're seen. What are the family resources? Um, 
and, and how does that play into the overall picture? So this issue of forming hypotheses is critically important. Um, and oftentimes, at least with the material that I send out ahead of time, and another chapter in the Rudder textbook are all of the questionnaires that are out there, and there, believe me, there are plenty of them. And I guess one of the things that I've been impressed with, with regard to YDY and the other clinic that Yanka and Shula run, is that regularly they will ask for clinical assessments to be done, whether it's neuropsychological testing or having information acquired ahead of time so that they really get uh, a clear sense of who this child is. And then they also do ratings that have the psychometric properties of the scales have been well established and you can actually then do some longitudinal tracking. So for example, one of the things that I heard about when I was meeting with the team earlier um, this week uh, was that they were looking at those children with autism who actually got better, who actually lost the clinical criteria to be called autistic, and they were looking at the characteristics of those individuals. And of course, it's wonderful that there are some of those individuals that have that degree of improvement. And what were all of the ingredients in terms of how they were cared for, but who were those children to begin with, and what was the nature of their families? So the parental interview is focused on the child's presenting problems, medical family history. I mean, you all know this. I don't need to go through it. It's in the chapter. Uh, feel free to read it. So how do, the, how do the parents understand the child's problems? To what degree do they have some empathy? Do they have some insight? Or is it just that he's causing problems? And we need to find, doctor, you need to find a way to stop him from doing that because it's really upsetting to me. I mean, you need to be hearing all of these elements and figuring out how best to move forward. And of course, are there certain triggers? Are there certain things in the environment that really make a difference in terms of when the symptoms show up that are the most upsetting? This was the trigger thing I was just mentioning. But of course, um, <laughs> the other thing I have to tell you, and this is true, and I guess it reminds me of when uh, Aras was uh, a very young boy. Uh, and we used to tra play uh, with trains. But the best part of my job is working with children. The best part of my job is interacting with the young kids that I see. And for better or for worse, um, some of the ones that I first saw back in the late 1970s, I'm still seeing and they're grown-ups, and one of the problems with that kind of strategy is that it's usually the patients who haven't done as well as you would like. But the fact that we've been maintaining a connection with them, that we are still, and who knows how many consultations they've been out to see, um, but it's, it's a belief in the importance of the connection and the interconnections that we have. But it's crucial to spend time with the child. Uh, care needs to be taken to minimize the child's distress. Um, and, you know, typically we'll walk them to the place where their parents are going to be and have them sort of see that and, oh, you can come back anytime you want. And we have somebody that's typically there with the child. And I can go through this, but as you all know, and many of you are quite experienced in this, uh, having the child be doing something that they actually enjoy doing while you're talking with them and interacting can be quite important. And it's often, uh, coming back to that example of Tourette syndrome, finding ways to have them express what the nature of their, let's say, their premonitory urges are, and then having them come back when they're with their parents and explaining, having them teach their parents what the nature of those feelings are can be really quite important. Um, and this is something you've learned about as well in terms of you know, things like the three wishes and things of that sort, if we had the opportunity to make a difference there. Um, I'm also really very curious about what the child's perception is about why the parent brought them, what their understanding of who this is and who I am and why I'm meeting with them. And usually we've been playing for a while before I would ask any of these questions, uh, and it really depends on the child in terms of the context, in terms of what we're up to. 
Yeah, so I guess I would also say it's really important to be present in the moment. Uh, it's the whole issue of being um, aware of looking at the facial expressions and sort of trying to read into them uh, some sort of degree of empathy. You know, what, you know, what is this guy trying to tell me? And does this make any sense to me? And things of that sort. Um, So I, I typically will go over with the child at the end uh, some of the things that I've learned. Of course, I say it in a way that is uh, understandable to the child. Um, and I try and answer each of those questions that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and this is the last set of things having to do with educating. So for, for me in the Tourette syndrome world, letting them know about the natural history of the disorder and the fact that the tics are usually reach their worst ever point at age 10, 11, 12, to teach them about the premonitory urges. Uh, but to whatever extent we have some knowledge, so the, let's say we talk about autism and we talk about how heterogeneous that condition is. You know, in, in psychiatry, uh, we have categories, we, you know, it's autism spectrum. But the truth is that it's such a heterogeneous condition and there are even monogenetic forms of the illness as well, the heterogeneity, both clinically and etiologically, is really impressive. So, you know, I will try and teach the parents to the extent that they're interested and want to know, but I try and cover all of the points that I think are crucially important for them. And it comes back to making these uh, connections and coming up with a treatment plan that they're on board with as well. So it's not just that I'm telling, oh, you need to take this medication and we're going to titrate the dose up this way. Let me share with them what the alternatives are. Here's this possibility. Here's that possibility. This is the one I'm thinking about. But let's discuss some of the other ones that, that are ones that you may want to learn more about before you make your decision about how best to proceed. So this is an example. We have, every year, we prepared this in-the-loop uh, newsletter. Of course, now it's all being done through the internet. We don't have the paper things uh, in the way that we had them before. But, you know, here are some of the individuals that are coming up in our field and what their expertise is and what the areas of new science are in terms of teaching us. So having a good foundation of what the latest science is can make a difference in my estimation. So, you know, it's, it's all about team building, it's all about trying to come up with a formulation, it's all about trying to figure out what's the next step. Because oftentimes it's not entirely clear all the things you're going to be doing and all the things you need to do, but let's come up with a team, let's come up with a common plan that we can agree on, and let's take it to the next step. So I think with that I'm going to close. Um, so I hope you don't mind my telling you my personal story. Um, and, and I did say, Aras, about our playing with the trains. I don't know if you remember that or not, but uh, we had a really good time um, in interacting. So let's open it up for questions, or if, if there are other uh, things going on, I may not have... Uh, but I, I would just say um, there are plenty of other chapters in that textbook. Uh, I was a little worried yesterday whether or not we'd actually be able to... So they actually handed out all the slides, too. How about that? They are serious about this. Okay. Jimebi, clock verbs. So we can we have earphones for him? I think you can just translate for me, Dr. Bianca. Uh, no. You're pretty good at Turkish. <laughs> yes, I am. I, I, will, I will talk in Turkish. So. Yes. Ee, öncelikle ilk e, bölümü tamamladık. E, teşekkür ediyorum. E, burada daha çok önemli olan tabii bu temel bilgilerin e, bizim gerek e, değişik ortamlarda çalışanlar için nasıl bir klinik uygulamaya nasıl yansıtılacağı konusunda daha çok sorular e, olacak ama ben bir parça e, süreci e, katkıda bulunmak açısından biraz önce söylediğin e, söylediğiniz şeylerden birisi e, ilişkiyi vurguladınız ve bu ilişkinin e, aslında çocukla ve ailesiyle klinisyenle e, temas öncesinde başladığını vurguladınız 
Ee, ve bunun değişik yolları üzerinde aslında durduk. Ve ondan sonra da bu terapetik anlamda bir verim getirmesi açısından bu bir ilaç tedavisi olabilir, bir terapi uygulaması olabilir. Bu ilişkide karşılıklı mutabakatların ve katılımın e, başarı ve süre, sürelilik açısından önemini vurguladınız. Eğer ben kendi aklımda kalanları özetlemem gerekirse. Burada e, ülkemizde bir kısmımız kamu sektöründe çalışıyor, bir kısmımız özel e, hani para karşılığında hizmet verilen ücretli sektörde çalışıyor. Fakat her durumda gerçekten e, zamanla ilgili sınırlar e, ana kısıtlayıcılardan birisi. Yani karşılıksız ya da karşılıklı da olsa çünkü zaman dünyada e, sınırlı. Hatta burada bence bizim size müteşekkir olmamız gereken şey en kıymetli şeyi zamanı getirip bize ayırdığınız, verdiğiniz için. E, dolayısıyla hastalarımızın, bize başvuranların e, zamanları ve bizim zamanlarımız kısıtlı olduğunda burada bu değerlendirme sürecinde ilk drop edeceğimiz, vazgeçeceğimiz şey sence, sizce ne olabilir? Şu olmadan da ben yapabilirim dediğiniz bir şey var mı? Well, I feel like I should ask Yanka Bey this question. Um, and, and then I will make a judgment about what he said. <gülüyor> Çünkü her nokta e, o kadar e, şey ki, temel ki, e, bilgi, ilişki, karşılıklı ilişkin akışı, devamlılığı, e, bir tanesini çıkardığımızda e, hani bu bizim çocukların boz yapları bir tane parça eksildiğinde oyun oynanamaz hale geliyor. İşin tadı kaçıyor. Fakat bir yandan da özellikle birçok yerde e, bu e, değerlendirme süreçlerinin mükemmeliyeti üzerine kafa yorduğumuzda hep bir eksiğimiz kaldığı hissi burada çalışan genç daha kıdemli birçok kişinin hep bir yerde bir eksik kaldık hissi bir yandan da belki bizi e, götüren ilerleten bir kuvvet de oluyor. Ama dolayısıyla aslında hiçbir şey eksik bırakmak istemiyoruz. Ama bu bir yandan da bu klinik işi yapan herkesin, bütün klinisyenlerin kötü rüyası yani hep bir eksik kaldı düşüncesi de veren bir yanı var. Bunu nasıl hallediyorsunuz bu tip şeyleri, duyguları? Yeah, well I think that uh, the reality is that none of us are perfect. And I guess for me... Um, the interconnection and sort of making it clear that somehow what's happening matters. On the other hand, if the setting that you're in is one where you're not going to be seeing that family again, and there's going to be, you know, who knows who is going to be seeing them the next time they come in, and I, my understanding is that that's not such an uncommon event in the public sector here in Turkey, then that's something that needs to be discussed with the family at that point in time because that's part of the reality that there's going to, they're going to be facing. And then the question is, if you have trouble in terms of the next go-round, in terms of the next follow-up visit, is there any way that they could be in touch with you? That is to say, with the person that did the initial evaluation? that you could actually help out and make sure that it's sort of moving forward in the right way. But this comes back to the whole issue of supervision, which we didn't talk much about. But I'm going to be advocating tomorrow because there's a retreat uh, that the YDY group is going to be having tomorrow. And I'm going to be talking about the importance of supervision and oversight and the continuity of care. So I, I think that we can do our best job with the amount of time that we have but finding a way to maintain that connection uh, is something that I would say as being really pretty important. So that's one of the things I would hate to lose. On the other hand, if the system doesn't allow that to happen, uh, then that's a reality that you need to face. Şöyle diyebilir miyiz? Ee, yani orada devamlılık önemli olan ve devamlılık aslında zihinlerimizde sürüp gitmekte olan bir devamlılık. Aslında birisiyle ilişkimiz sadece onun o andaki gerçek etkileşimimiz değil, onun zihnimizdeki temsiliyle olan ilişkilerimizde. Yani şu anda yaşamayan büyüklerimizle, hocalarımızla olan 
ilişkimiz e, gibi aslında bir yerde bir şekilde e, hastalarımız ve aileleriyle kurduğumuz ilişki o anda o odada olup bitmiyor ve öncesi sonrası artıları ve eksileri devam eden bir ilişki oluyor. Ve ilişki tabii bir yandan da bana şu örneği hatırlattı aslında uzun zamandır e, düşünmediğim hatırlamamış olduğum bir e, durum. Ben 80'li yılların sonunda izninizle kendimden bir örnek vereyim. Ee, çocuk psikiyatri daha e, alanında değildim. Yetişkin psikiyatri alanında Türkiye'de Amerika gitmeden önce eğitim alırken rahmetli Esat Göktepe hocamızla e, beraber çalışıyordum. E, fakat Esat hocanın da en büyük özelliklerinden birisi çok açık görüşlü bir insan olması. Açık görüşlülüğü şöyle, kendisi daha biyolojik oryantasyonlu bir psikiyatrist ama işte Engin Geçtan gibi, Cahit Ardalı gibi psikanalitik, psikodinamik oryantasyonlu kişileri e, süpervizör olarak bize e, atıyordu. Ve Cahit Bey bu kişilerden ve o da yakın zamanda kaybettiğimiz birisi benimle aynı odada oturur. Beraber hasta görürüz. Ben poliklinikte oturuyorum. Gider gelir Cahit Bey de orada. Ve biraz böyle e, şey sorular, konfrontasyonel sorular soran bir kişiydi. İşte niye öyle yaptın, niye böyle dedin vesaire gibi ama ben de hasta sinirlenecek diye falan böyle çekiniyorum. Şimdi kızdırmayalım, yani niye böyle konuşuyorsunuz? Yok yok böyle metotlar. Ve ben her seferinde ne kadar e, Cahit Bey böyle confrontational yaklaştığı durumlarda işte ne bileyim haftanın iki günü geliyordu. Ben de bütün gün oturuyordu. Enteresan büyük bir şanslı tabii benim için. Bütün hastalarla ilgili tek tek tartışabiliyorduk. Hasta gelir iki gün sonra ya da bir hafta sonra bir bakınır falan. Ne oldu? Öbür doktor yok mu? Ee, şimdi tabii hani bir yaşça büyük ve tecrübeli birisinin olması yanı sıra orada bir ilişki doğması ve o ilişkiyi kişi arıyor. Yani o ilişkiyi kimle kurduğumuz çok mühim. Yani benim bugünkü konferansın aklımda kalan biz devam edecek, yaşayacak bir ilişkiyi nasıl oluştururuz? Ve bu ilişkiyi oluşturmanın şartlarından birisi o kişilerin bizim karşımıza gelirken kafalarında olan sorularla bizim oradan ayrılırken yanlarında götürdükleri arasındaki örtüşme. Yeah, so I would agree completely with what Bianca Bey just said. I would also say that so often in my experience there are separation issues uh, within families whether they have Tourette syndrome or some other disorder and it's the disconnection that is bringing them to the clinic and finding ways to reestablish connections that are threatened by, you know, the... Because sometimes kids are very good, let's say, with disruptive behavior. And one of the things that is a very common use for disruptive behavior is that it gets the attention of the parents. Uh, we saw a case together just a few days ago, and I guess I was really convinced that some of the disruptive behavior that we were hearing about was because the dad wasn't paying any attention to him and he needed to find a way to sort of connect in a way that would lead, even if it was negative attention. And so in seeing that, uh, it began to be something that I could point out to the family and begin to think with them about what could we do together to make a difference with regard to that interaction. That being said, um, you know, it's wonderful that Yonke is such a distinguished clinician and uh, writer and scholar uh, because everybody wants to see him. And all I would say is, let's make sure that he sees you as the trainee when he's actually engaged with you in YDY or whatever. And let's make sure he's there and like that fellow, and I'm not sure he's going to be as, as grumpy as the other fellow in saying things that uh, were confront confronting, although he does have a little bit of a reputation like that. It's probably a little different now than it was a few years ago. Uh, but sometimes he does say things that uh, are a little provocative. I don't know whether that's entirely true or not. Uh, I, I think that also works, pardon, bu aynı zamanda iki yönde giden bir ilişki. E, mesela aramızda çünkü çok genç arkadaşlarımız da var. E, bazen e, gelen aileler yani ilişkide hani dediğiniz gibi işte efendim tanınmış olmak, meşhur olmak, şöyle olmak, böyle olmak gibi faktörler rol oynuyor ama e, bunu aşan bir yanı var. O yüzden örneğin daha çok yakın zamanda bizim e, benim güzel günler poliklinine gelen 
kişilerden birisi. E, bizim orada mesela çalışan bir intern, e, psikoloji, ar- psikoloji interni bir arkadaşımızı örneğin bir sonraki gelişinde ben onu görmek istiyorum diye tut- tutturması da mümkün olabiliyor. Orada ya ben acaba burada ne yapabilirim diye düşünen belki çok kıdemsiz pek bir e, becerisi olmayan bir kişi o kişiyle bir ilişki yakalayabiliyor. Sanırım gelişmek, mesleki gelişim aslında birçok alanda bu öğretmenlikten avukatlığa aslında gelişen bir alanda. Hani bu kıdemsiz, de, kıdemsiz diye tanımladığımız junior'daki o işe asılma, yakalama, iyi bir şeyler yapma arzusuyla e, yetişmiş daha kıdemli kişideki e, bilgi, deneyim, Min ikisinin bir arada olduğu durumlar, yani birisinde artık bıkkınlık ve usanmışlığın olmaması, öbüründe de diğerinin zaman içinde karıştır kazanabileceği bilgelik ve deneyimin olması ideal bir mix şey bir harmanı e, oluşturuyor. <gülüyor> Tabii böyle bir şey nerede var bilmiyorum. Tam bir şeyler öğrendik, bu sefer de yorulduk oluyoruz yani genellikle e, yapmaya. E, diğerinde de yani yorgunluk yok, enerji çok ama bilgi ve deneyim pek fazla yok. Böyle bir Hayatın doğal çelişkisi herhalde bu. Well, I'm glad that you have all of the knowledge and skill and the enthusiasm and that you haven't gone over the edge yet in terms of uh, having had enough because I think we can really make a difference in the lives of the families that we serve. That's why we're here and the connections that you can make with them and the way in which you interact with them matter. And whatever the realities are in terms of how long you can see them and what the future holds, let's be present in this moment and let's see if we can make that connection and have it be something that will have potentially an impact. E, salondan e, görüşünü belirtmek isteyen çünkü soru da olabilir, katkı, yorum, e, Or, or just be confrontative and say, why did you say that? That's ridiculous. <laughs>